if they are so incapable of getting a grip on the asylum system and taking asylum decisions effectively here in the UK, they want to pay a country halfway across the world to take those decisions for us. Now, on the lawfulness of the decision, the court accepted that Rwanda doesn't have asylum processing capacity, including interpreters or legal support, to take these decisions, but it's concluded the agreement is still lawful because of two key things that the number of people Rwanda takes will be very limited and that there will be lots more money provided by the UK government. The Home Secretary didn't tell us about any of those things. Mm. So can she now tell us yeah. how many people does she expect yeah. to send to Rwanda how next many? year? Yeah. Rwanda has said it can accommodate 200 people. That is 0.5% of this year's channel crossings. The Home Office itself has said there's no evidence it will act as a deterrent and that it is unenforceable and has a high risk of fraud. Secondly, can she tell us the full cost? The court said there will be significant additional funding provided. The government's already written Rwanda two cheques this year, one for £120 million, another this summer for £20 million. Millions more are promised. So how much more? And how much is this going to end up costing per person? Because it looks like over a million pounds per person at the moment. And third, the court judgment says there's no evidence the UK government sought to investigate either the terms of the Rwanda-Israel agreement or the way it had worked in practice. Why on earth not? Because that agreement was abandoned with evidence that it had increased trafficking and the activity yeah, of criminal gangs. Convictions for people smuggling have already dropped by 75% in the space of two years. Convictions for people trafficking are already pitifully low, and a former Chief Constable has warned the Borders Act will make that worse. Yeah. Time and again, the, criminal, the government is failing to tackle the criminal gangs who are driving this or to make them pay the price. So instead of this unworkable, unethically, ex unethical, extortionally expensive and deeply damaging policy, the government should be using this investment to go after the gangs who are putting lives at risk. Yeah. Time and again, all they are doing is chasing headlines, and these are distractions, damaging distractions government from the serious hard work to tackle the gangs and sort out the asylum system. The Home Secretary has said that the Conservatives are in last chance saloon. It is their policies that have put them there and that have let the country down, always ramping up the rhetoric, never doing the serious hard work or common sense. Britain deserves better than this. Britain is better than this. Yeah, yeah. Secretary. I'm very disappointed by the response from the Shadow Home oh. Secretary and more actually concerned that she's actually seeking to go behind what is a legitimate decision by our independent judiciary set out rigorously, exhaustively, thoroughly and suggest that this is still uh, an illegitimate scheme. We've seen through this uh, judgment that this is now lawful on several grounds. The judgment looked at the legislative authority. It looked very closely about the claims as to whether it breached Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Article 14 of the ECHR, Article 31 of the Refugee Convention. It looked very closely about whether it was fair and uh, uh, or whether access to justice was respected. It looked very closely at other public law grounds. And on all of those claims, the Home Office won. The court concluded that it was lawful, that it is lawful for the government to make arrangements for relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda and for their asylum claims to be determined in Rwanda rather than the UK. And that judgment is a comprehensive analysis of the reasons why. The Honourable Randallet does ask about the eight individual cases, uh, and we, have, we accept the judgment of the court on those individual cases cases. We have already taken steps to strengthen the case working process, including by revising the information and the guidance given to individuals during their assessment for relocation. But we have been clear throughout that no one will be relocated if it is unsafe for them, and support is offered to individuals throughout the process to ensure that it is fair and robust. But, Mr Speaker, the simple truth here is that Labour have opposed every one of our efforts to deter illegal migration. They've opposed the Nationality and Borders Act. They've opposed life sentences against people smugglers. They've opposed the removal 
of foreign national offenders, including drug dealers and rapists. All they offer is obstruction and criticism and performative politics of opposition and magical thinking. Because what, what do they actually offer? They say return to the failed Dublin scheme, no matter that it was ineffective, no matter that the EU doesn't want it. They want safe and legal routes as the answer, no matter that this government has done more than any other in recent history, yeah. offering sanctuary to over 450,000 people by safe and legal routes, no matter that they can't actually define what routes they would stand up themselves. No matter that our capacity is not unlimited, Mr Speaker, and that there are over 100 million people displaced globally, would Labour give them all a safe and legal route to the UK? Mr Speaker, we cannot indulge in fictions. The fundamental reason that Labour can't articulate a plan is that they can't be honest. They can't be honest with the British public about what they really want. The Shadow Home Secretary couldn't even decide if she would repeal illegal entry, even though she voted against it. Their solution would be to turn our crisis of illegal migration into a crisis of legal migration. Open borders by the back door. Unlimited safe and legal routes is simply open borders masquerading as humanitarianism. Mr Speaker, Last week, the Prime Minister and I announced our plan to tackle small boats. Today, the court affirmed the legality of a central piece in that plan. And tomorrow, Mr Speaker, Labour still won't have a plan. Sir William Cash. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Although the High Court ruled that the Rwanda policy is lawful, there were, as has been said in that case, only eight asylum claimants. Those cases have been all set aside by the court because it, they said at the same time in their ruling that the circumstances of each claimant had not been considered properly. The latest Home Office website figures currently show that there are over 160,000 such individual cases outstanding. Furthermore, as the Home Secretary, in whom I have the greatest confidence, it stated, the European Court judge who issued the injunction clearly did so without proper consideration of the Rwanda policy, and such rulings do not command our respect. Does my right honourable friend accept that for all these reasons it becomes more essential than ever to apply the notwithstanding formula to the new legislation which the Prime Minister has now announced in mid-January, which must also distinguish in our own law between genuine refugees and illegal economic migrants, not only in the interests of saving life, but also preventing organised criminality, but in also asserting UK parliamentary sovereignty, overriding the European Convention, and at the same time dealing comprehensively with the current backlog of those 160,000 outside outstanding asylum cases in that legislation. Secretary. Well, my honourable friend makes a very important point, and what I want to be clear about is that the European Court of Human Rights did not rule on um, the lawfulness of our policy, it did not rule that the policy or relocations were unlawful, but it did nonetheless prohibit the removal of the individuals on the 14th of June flight via uh, interim and injunctive relief. We have a proud tradition of defending fundamental rights in this country, and this, we will always retain a robust approach to protecting uh, and preserving human rights. However, that does not mean that we will, be, uh, 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 we will have a migration system that can be abused and exploited by those who do not have legitimate claims to be here. Uh, and as the Prime Minister announced last week, we will be bringing forward legislation to ensure that we have a robust migration system and secure borders. Yeah. SNP spokesperson Alison Poulos. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a dark day indeed uh, this, with this judgment, and particularly when the Home, of, the Home Secretary come here, comes here to imply that having morals is fanciful. Enver Solomon of the Refugee Council has called this decision wrong in this policy wrong in principle and unworkable in practice. And I am certain that this will go to appeal as the charities and those involved uh, in it have uh, stated. In the SNP benches, we will never get behind this policy, not in our name. And I remind people in this House that slavery, apartheid and marital rape were all lawful at one time, but none of them were right. 
The court found that the Home Office failed to consider properly the circumstances of the eight who challenged this policy. So can I ask the Home Secretary how exactly, the Home Sec how exactly she will intend to approach these cases now? What happens to these, uh, these eight individuals? What happens also to the others uh, who have already been issued with notices of intent? What confidence can they have in a system that didn't, co that didn't properly consider the cases of eight people previously? The Home Secretary claims that this will be a deterrent. Well, the Tories also claimed that the hostile environment would be a deterrent, that the Nationality and Borders Act would be a deterrent, and now the Rwanda policy will be a deterrent. None of them are working because they fail to recognise the very desperate circumstances that drive people yeah, yeah. to come here in the first place. Safe and legal routes will work and will prevent people being losing their lives in the channel. The Home Secretary in her statement talked about the trade in human cargo and we all want to tackle the people smugglers that exploit people uh, in the most vulnerable of circumstances. But I ask her, what else is this policy, this Rwanda policy, but state-sponsored people trafficking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask her how many people are actually going to be removed to Rwanda? It's going to be a tiny, tiny proportion and therefore any deterrent effect that they claim is not going to be proper. Um, can I ask her the total cost, lastly, of this scheme as well, this unworkable scheme? Because how, how much money has been spent on it already? How much of it has gone in the legal case? And how much would it have been better spent dealing with the catastrophic backlog of cases that the Tories have created? Yeah. Um, Secretary. Well, I'm afraid that the Honourable Lady's ideological zeal is blinding um, and preventing her from taking a rational approach. I'm very proud of the fact that we've welcomed 450,000 people through safe and legal routes to this country since 2015. And I don't think anyone can claim that we aren't forward-leaning on, on all of this. And I think that the Honourable Lady and her party really needs to be honest about their position with the British people. They stand for open borders and uncontrolled migration. Jacob rees -Mogg. Mr Deputy Speaker, Parliament has legislated, our courts have ruled. We are apparently stopped by a Russian judge woken from a bar to issue an injunction. Can, can this stand? Well, as always, my right honourable friend makes a very powerful point, and uh, I would just say that I, uh, the Prime Minister, neither the Prime Minister or I are, de are deterred from delivering upon this policy. It's an essential part of our wider plans to break the business model, to stop illegal migration. We have a legitimate basis for it. It has been upheld after being rigorously tested in our courts. We will continue to move quickly in order to honour the will of the British people. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Home Secretary says that Britain has a proud tradition of supporting asylum seekers. That is true in part, but it's not true under her tenure. Yeah. She is pursuing a vile policy which is brutal towards the individuals concerned and continually tells us that it is illegal to seek asylum. It is not. It is clearly there in all international conventions. Will she for once? have a sense of humanity towards people who are desperate and are victims of wars, of environmental change, of human rights abuse and exploited to, to boot. Cannot she just hold out a hand of friendship and understanding towards these desperate people rather than this brutal assertion she's making today? The Right Honourable Gentleman keeps talking uh, on a regular basis about safe and legal routes as being a means to uh, an end of illegal arrivals, but the reality is that our safe and legal routes already have allowed 450,000 people to come here since 2015, 300,000 in the last year alone, the highest number that we've seen in several decades. But that needs to happen in conjunction with deterrent policies if they are to have any effect and if we are to stop the practice of people taking lethal and unlawful journeys across the Channel, jumping the queue, undermining the British people's generosity and breaking the law. Yeah. Edward Lee. Welcome. It won't solve the problem, not just because of the relatively few numbers 
that can be deported to Rwanda, but because each case must be fought individually and human rights lawyers will fight every single case individually. That is the problem. Surely the only serious way we can deter migration across the Channel is to have the legal right not just to process people when they arrive on our shores, but to arrest them and detain them until their asylum application is dealt with. Now, is there anything in the Refugee Convention which stops us doing that? If there isn't, why aren't we doing it? And if it's a Human Rights Act that stops us doing it, can we not apply in our new legislation for a notwithstanding clause to deal with that problem? Well, um, we, this is exactly why the Prime Minister announced last week and I and uh, the Immigration Minister are working intensively to prepare legislation which will be introduced next year um, and, that, and, and it will uh, deliver a scheme along the lines of what he's just described whereby if you come here irregularly or illegally, uh, i.e. on a small boat, uh, putting yourself and others at risk, you will be detained and you will be swiftly removed to a safe third country or to Rwanda for your asylum claim to be processed. Kevin Jones. The uh, Home Secretary, in a statement, confirmed that the Permanent Secretary of the Home Office had concerns about the cost and that she overruled him. Now, we've spent £140 million so far and not one single individual is being uh, removed. When the Honourable Member for Corby was the Immigration Minister, he said that the average cost of, of removing people would be £12,000. Some it was not based on any fact. So if she's so confident about the scheme, she took a decision to overrule the Permanent Secretary. Will she not today publish all the costs uh, of, of this scheme uh, so that we can all take a view of whether it is good, uh, a good use of taxpayers' money or whether it's not just simply a way of fulfilling one of her weird dreams? The Honourable Gentleman needs to get his facts right because actually the, uh, the policy was, the agreement was struck between my predecessor, the right friend, my, my right one friend, the member for Whitham, uh, and the Rwandan government. Um, but I support the work that she did and the achievement that she struck, which is that, she, uh, that the agreement it represents a long-term policy. It's expected to last for at least five years, and the costs and the payments will depend on the number of people relocated, the timing of when that happens, and the outcomes of the individual cases. Of course, we've been held up by litigation, uh, and once the litigation process comes to an end, we will move quickly to deliver it and deliver value for money. Yeah. Natalie Elphick. Um, I, I am saddened that following last week's tragic events, neither the Shadow uh, Home Secretary or the SNP Labour front, uh, sorry, SNP front bench, are prepared to actually say that people should not be getting into these boats yeah. in the first place. Yeah. They should be claiming refuge and asylum in the one of the 149 convention countries, many of which they Absolutely. will have gone through. I, I, um, I, I welcome uh, today's judgment um, from the High Court. But I ask my right honourable friend, that isn't it even better than Rwanda that people stay safe on land in France who do not take these crossings in the first place? Yeah. Secretary. My honourable friend is absolutely right. People should not be making this journey. Uh, they should not be crossing through other safe countries uh, and they shouldn't be choosing to come to the United Kingdom by these means. Uh, and the sooner that we are able to deliver a policy that reflects that, the better. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The courts have been very clear. It is wrong to have a blanket approach to the treatment of refugees, just as it would be wrong to decide that everybody caught speeding could never drive again. What matters is treating each case on its merits. Now, we've seen already how poorly this government is treating children who are here who are refugee children. The Home Secretary talks about being honest, so let's finally have some honest, straight answers. For avoidance of doubt, Will the Home Secretary confirm whether or not she is intending to deport children or those who are looking after children who are here who are refugees to Rwanda? Yes or no? Will children be on those flights, Ministers? Well, we've been very clear that families are not subject to the Rwandan 
policy. But the broader point is this. There is a, she takes a different reading of the judgment uh, than I do. There's been an extensive and exhaustive analysis of the legal claims brought against the government, um, and the court has been pretty emphatic on the legality of the policy. Uh, it's concluded that the uh, scheme is compliant with our ECHR com uh, obligations and with our refugee uh, obligations. So John Whittingdale. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I tell my rightable friend that two months ago I visited Hope Hostel in Kigali, where not only was the accommodation of a high standard, but the Rwandans I spoke to expressed their hope that those coming would in due course obtain jobs and move out to their own homes, thus allowing more refugees to come and take their place. So does she not agree that this policy is not just lawful, it is also humane in that it offers refugees a real hope? Absolutely, and he is reiterating a point which is extensively dealt with in the body of the judgment. Right. And I refer, honourable members, um, right, members, to that judgment where there's a complete uh, analysis of the exact kind of support that people will receive when they're in Rwanda, the kind of monitoring that will go on to ensure that their welfare is safeguarded, and the track record that Rwanda has demonstrated in supporting refugees from the region in previous instances. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, yeah, Mr Speaker. It, it's frustrating to stand here and listen to the Secretary of State because none of us are denying that it's a legal ruling, but whether or not it is lawful, this plan is immoral, ineffective and incredibly costly for taxpayers. Instead of wasting taxpayers' money defending a policy through the courts, does the Secretary of State not agree that the government should be focusing on stopping these dangerous crossings and tackling the smugglers and tra trafficking by providing more safe and legal routes and sanctuary for refugees, rather than dealing with the problem after people arrive here. Deal with it at source so they are never put in the position where they take the dangerous crossing across the channel. Well, as the justices make clear at the beginning of their judgment, they're not opining on the politics or the morality of the Rwanda scheme. They are uh, simply opining on the lawfulness, and that's why I have huge confidence in the judgment that's just been handed down today. But if we're talking about the broader issues, I mean, I gently disagree with the honourable lady, as you would imagine. I, d I think what's actually unacceptable is that her party is peddling uh, a mistruth to the British people. It's saying that we can have an unlimited and open borders policy and we have unlimited capacity and everybody's welcome. Unfortunately, the reality, the reality is that is not the case and we have to take a pragmatic, measured and compassionate approach to our migration. And that's what's sensible and required by the British people. Greg Smith. Mr Deputy Speaker, central to solving the crisis of illegal migration is the prevention of further loss of human life in the English Channel. So not only do I welcome today's judgment, but my right honourable friend's commitment in her statement to deliver the Rwanda partnership at scale and as soon as possible. But it is clear that there will be continued, continued legal challenges to it, either on an individual basis or on a whole policy basis. So can I push the Home Secretary further on the point made by my right honourable friend for Stone that the legislation coming in the new year that I look forward to supporting really must include a notwithstanding clause to ensure that we can prevent that loss of further human life yeah, in the yeah. Channel? Yeah. So right. what, what's essential is that we uh, introduce, uh, consider and pass legislation that will be uh, robust uh, and resilient and actually deliver upon our stated political objectives. That will require an exhaustive analysis of the legal methods, but simply put, we're in the process, uh, we're in the sausage machine, as they would put it, so it's not a pretty sight, but uh, nothing is off the table. Yeah. Yeah. Antonia Azzi. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Home Secretary said over the weekend that she is considering leaving the European Convention on Human Rights in order to prevent people claiming asylum. Is it possible, Mr Deputy Speaker, to do this without breaking our commitments in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement? Mm. Good question. I think what's clear is that there are uh, 
uh, evident challenges with the way in which international conventions and agreements relating to migration are working in the 21st century. I think there are legitimate questions that at the international level all nation states are grappling with. I've seen that firsthand when I've spoken to my counterparts at the Calais Group or other international partners. There is a, a, an unprecedented scale of illegal migration. There are, is unprecedented pressure on domestic resources. And I think looking at how we can forge a new uh, uh, set of agreements to work better together is definitely a reasonable approach. Sir Desmond Swain. Were more safe and legal routes to be made available, they would quickly be taken up and the trade in small boats would then continue unabated, yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't it? Yes. Ben. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could the Home Secretary clarify for the House? If someone arrives on uh, the shores at Dover to claim asylum in order to be able to join a child, a spouse, or an elderly parent here in the United Kingdom, right to family life, can she assure the House that that individual would not be put on a plane to Rwanda and separated from their family for the rest of their lives? The reality is that anybody arriving here uh, irregularly will be um, eligible for consideration. We will it, consider every case on its individual merits. Uh, we have excluded families from the scheme, uh, but we will also ensure that the, uh, the, the, the decisions are made on a lo lawful and rational basis. Because, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> The, uh, I, I very much welcome the uh, ruling today and, and the comments of, of the Home Secretary. And it's quite clear from what we're hearing from members opposite that there's a great gulf uh, between uh, their views and the, uh, the vast majority of the British people. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly, my constituents mm -hmm. want, want to see the uh, Ho Home Secretary and the Prime Minister's proposals implemented as quickly as possible. In particular, there is genuine concern about the speed of uh, processing uh, the many cases. And although uh, additional staff are being taken on, the pitiful number of, ca of cases they're dealing with on a weekly basis needs to be dr dramatically improve. Can my right honourable friend assure me that action is being taken to ensure that happens? Secretary. Processing asylum claims is one core element of solving the challenge uh, more broadly, and that's why it's right that we're increasing the number of case workers, increasing their specialism, streamlining the process, because ultimately we want to bear down on the numbers of people waiting for a decision from the Home Office. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Home Secretary says she's taking a deterrent approach, but it's plain that today's judgment cannot and will not function as a so-called deterrent, since the whole point of this vile policy of expelling asylum seekers to Rwanda is that expulsion was supposed to happen automatically and rapidly for anyone without a prior permission to come here via a, a refugee scheme. But today's High Court judgment found that each and every individual case must be assessed first, so there'll be nothing automatic about it, and under this government, there'll be nothing rapid about it either. So will she put a permanent end to this useless cruelty, provide safe and legal routes, and ensure that such routes actually function, because the one from Afghanistan currently doesn't? And will she stop saying that this policy has the support of the British people? There is a recent poll from YouGov that shows that just 10% yep. actually support this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The British people are better than this vile British government. Well, I think that um, the reality is that uh, we are supported in taking control over our borders. That was reflected in the 2016 referendum, endorsed in the 2019 referendum uh, uh, election. And, and we have made clear that we will do whatever it takes to ensure we, get, uh, uh, we make progress on stopping illegal migration, we uh, bring an end to people taking this lethal journey, and ultimately re we restore integrity to our immigration system. Tom Hunt. Deputy Speaker, 
I welcome the judgment today. I find it deeply frustrating though, that just one isolated judge can delay this process for around six or seven months. Um, will the Home Secretary give me some sense of the timescales? You've had today's judgment. When are the first flights going to take off? That is what we all want to see. And that's when my constituents will begin to rest easy when they can see those flights taken off. And also, finally, um, we will probably have to strike agreements with other countries. Um, can the Home Secretary assure me that when we do strike agreements with other countries, they are not delayed in the same way that this one has been delayed, and we don't go through exactly the same motions again, which take oh so long? Well, um, it's, he, he's, he's right that you know, we've always maintained that this policy is lawful, and today the court has upheld that. We know that there are further legal challenges that are possible, and we will continue to vigorously defend this in the courts going forward. But uh, once the litigation process has come to an end, we will move swiftly to be in a position to operationalise it and deliver on our promise. Joanna Cherry. Deputy Speaker, can I just caution the Home Secretary gently against getting too overexcited about our decision at first instance? Mm -hmm. um, often important constitutional decisions at first instance are overturned on appeal. Think of example for recently uh, when uh, the last Prime Minister but one unlawfully prorogued Parliament. Mm -hmm. And I think an appeal here is inevitable. And in the meantime, <coughs> removals to Rwanda can't take place because of the interim measures issued by the European Court of Human Rights. And maybe she'd like to explain to some of her backbenchers the concept of an interim order issued by a judge sitting alone to preserve the status quo, which happens, I believe, in English law regularly by way of injunction. Yep. But my question to her is this. She seems to be implying that she will obtemper the order of the European Court of Human Rights, which, of course, was issued under Article 30 of the Convention, which the United Kingdom is bound by. But I know she's not a great fan of the Convention, and a lot of her backbenchers are asking her about this notwithstanding clause. So can I ask her this? Is it her intention to domestically legislate her way out of our international treaty obligations? Here, 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 here. Well, um, it's not appropriate for me to speculate on the response of the claimants or whether there will be any uh, subsequent appeals um, following today's judgment. We welcome today's findings and we will vigorously defend any appeal on the substantive matters of the lawfulness of the policy. Uh, we've been clear that in uh, designing and introducing our legislation next year, we will have to ensure that it is sufficiently robust to, uh, to, to promote a scheme that, uh, that means that if you are arriving here illegally, you will be detained and you will be swiftly removed to a safe country uh, for your asylum claim to be processed. Philip Hollabane. Ettering welcome the High Court judgment and want to see these relocation flights to Rwanda take off as soon as possible. They will be very concerned to hear today that this could be subject to further judicial delay. Could the Home Secretary outline to my constituents in Kettering how long she anticipates that judicial delay will be? And when can I tell my constituents that the flights will take off? Well, the reality of litigation is that uh, there are always there, there are appeal rights. There is a hearing on the 16th of January at which the claimants and the Home Office will make representations regarding uh, any applications to appeal. The court will decide the next steps, uh, if any, in UK litigation. We are currently considering in the UK's um, the Home Office's position um, uh, uh, with my legal team, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to discuss what our strategy is in the meantime. But uh, yes, there is a hearing on the 16th of January to consider uh, appeal applications. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, the Red Honourable Lady uh, tries very hard to find the way forward on a solution, which I absolutely acknowledge and defer to the High Court ruling. I say this with great respect to the Right Honourable Lady. Uh, what is clear is that we have a duty of care, and I believe, along with many others in this nation, in this House today and outside of this House, do not believe that this scheme fulfils our moral obligation. So can the Secretary of State again confirm that should another way of dealing with the current situation is identified, better regulation in the English Channel, uh, better processes in France, more acceptable or extra ways of migration for those who wish to and, and there will be others, that this will be given consideration, as I do believe that there has to be 
a more compassionate approach that can be taken? Here, here. Here, here. I think the solution uh, involves a multifaceted approach, and that's why we are working very closely with the French. And I was very pleased to strike an agreement last month with my French counterpart to bolster our co cooperation on the channel. Uh, information and intelligence sharing, uh, for the first time ever, UK border force officials working hand in hand with our French counterpart counterparts in France. That's why I've also uh, worked closely with other interior ministers from European nations on this similar issue. That's why we need to work on our asylum backlog. That's why we need to uh, uh, introduce legislation. The Rwanda scheme is one element of a very uh, multi-dimensional programme, uh, uh, and I think we need all elements to work in tandem. Jack Brereton. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Home Secretary knows, Stoke-on-Trent has already done more than our fair share, and this has put huge pressure on our local public services. So would my right honourable friend agree that it's really important that we get on now with delivering this policy and get on with those flights as soon as possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, I pay tribute to him and his uh, Stoke parliamentary colleagues, the local authorities, and uh, all of those involved in supporting asylum seekers in Stoke. And I, uh, and I know that there is a high number of people currently accommodated uh, in, in, his, uh, in his area. Uh, it is therefore vital that we stop people coming in the first place, and delivering the Rwanda partnership is key to making that happen. And Kaiser. Deputy Speaker, it is the super rich and those on luxury yachts, not small boats, that people should be scared of. Asylum seekers are people just like us. They have hopes, dreams and aspirations. This policy could be legally sound, but it's immoral and a waste of taxpayers' money. This cruel government should be ashamed of themselves. The Home Secretary in her statement said, this judgment thoroughly vindicates the Rwanda partnership and that it's what the overwhelmingly majority of the British people want to see happen. Of course, the Rwanda partnership wasn't in the Tory manifesto. So can she evidence this support, that people across all four nations want the Rwanda deal because Scotland said Certainly doesn't, and Scotland will continue to reject these xenophobic policies. Well, the, the reality is, is that actually uh, stopping people taking the journey in the first place is the compassionate and pragmatic approach. It delivers for the British people, but it also sends a message to those people smugglers, human traffickers, and those who are deliberately taking the journey to come here for illegitimate means not to do so. That's the sensible approach going forward. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, could I welcome the judgment today that confirms the government's policy is legal and will be a step forward to implementing what the Prime Minister said last week. The Home Secretary is right that we need to destroy the, the, break the business model of the people smugglers. Does she agree with me that it's not enough just to go after the supply, even though those people are immoral and parasitic? We need to destroy the demand for these journeys in the first place. And the way we'll achieve that is by making clear that those that come by boat won't be allowed to stay in this country. That's what worked in Australia. That's what will work here. Yeah. He's absolutely right, and I've met with Australian officials who were involved in the design of their sovereign borders programme, and they say uh, very much that, that actually once they were able to remove illegal entrance to Papua New Guinea or Nauru, they saw a dramatic change in the numbers of people attempting the journey in the first place, uh, and that's the model upon which our Rwanda scheme is based. Stuart C. Macdonald. If every country took this government's approach, this Rwanda approach, the countries who already host the overwhelming majority of refugees, the Jordans, the Lebanons, the Pakistans, the Ugandas of this world, the first countries, they would instead be required to host all of them, while wealthy Western countries like the United Kingdom exactly. could pick and choose if and when they wanted to help out. What this government is arguing for is a ve the end to the international system of refugee protection, is it not? Well said. Of course it is. I really um, disagree with the moral high ground that my honourable friend seems to be taking here. In light of Scotland's paltry record in taking asylum seekers, they've refused to take anybody who's come here on a small boat. And that, Mr Speaker, is unacceptable. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome uh, the statement today and the judgment. But will uh, the Secretary of State confirm to this House that she will continue to use every tool in her 
power to stop these boats. As you can see, the opposition and there will be the human rights lawyers who will try and stop what the, the good work that the Secretary of State is doing because the people of Doncaster are tired of being taken advantage of by these illegal immigrants. So will she confirm to the House that she will continue to use everything, every power that she has? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend not only speaks for the people of Doncaster, but he speaks for the people of Britain uh, in his question there and expressing the sentiment that the British people are tired uh, and they want this problem to be fixed. It's only this government that's going to do it. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. How many of the people who were pulled from the Channel last week does she think should be sent to Rwanda? They wouldn't be well, uh, the incident last week was tragic. People died. Precious human lives were lost. Uh, people had been exploited and took a journey which was unlawful and lethal and, in the end, tragic. That's what we want to bring to an end. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The court found that the Home Office would have to consider asylum seekers' particular circumstances before deporting them to Rwanda. Does the Home Secretary acknowledge that this defeats the purpose of this scheme, where the original intent was to have applications assessed in Rwanda under Rwandan law, and as such will she reconsider? Well, the, the, the judgment is very clear that our arrangement, which means that people will be relocated to Rwanda for their asylum claims to be processed, uh, and then they will be resettled uh, there, that, that's been found to be lawful, and there's been an extensive analysis of all the potential legal claims that could render that unlawful, uh, and the Home Office has won. I'm to the end of that statement. I'd like to thank the Home Secretary for her statement today and responding to questions for over 50 minutes. And we're now moving on to the next statement, which is on the Convention on Biodiversity, COP15 Outcomes. And I call Therese Coppick. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. With your permission, I'd like to update the House on the outcome of COP15 of the Convention on Biodiversity, which was held in Montreal, and from which I have just returned. For too long, nature has been overlooked, the Cinderella of the story. But flora and fauna are important in and of themselves. Nature is both the essential foundation and a powerful engine for our economies, and helping nature recover is one of the most effective, cost-effective ways we can tackle so many challenges, including the causes and impacts of climate change, thirst, hunger and health, and bolstering peace and prosperity. Early this morning, the world came together to secure the strong, ambitious global framework we need to catalyse a decade of environmental action on the scale of the Paris Agreement as for climate, putting nature firmly on the map. The agreement includes global targets to protect at least 30% of the world's land and at least 30% of the global ocean by 2030, and to see natural systems restored, populations of species recovering and extinctions halted. It includes reporting and review mechanisms that will hold all of us to account for making timely progress on bringing our promises to life. And it includes commitments on digital sequence information to make sure communities in nature-rich countries feel the benefit of sharing the solutions that we know their flora and fauna can provide. Behind the scenes, over, very, over many months now, we've been working with Ecuador, Gabon and the Maldives to develop the credible 10-point plan for financing biodiversity during this decade that played a critical role in getting this agreement over the line by giving nature-rich countries confidence in our collective willingness and ability to secure the investment needed to protect natural wonders on which their people, and in many cases, the whole world, depends. And on the back of those efforts, public, private and philanthropic, philanthropic donors committed billions of dollars of new investment in nature. The agreement itself includes commitments to create a new international fund for nature, to increase investment in nature from all sources to $30 billion a year by 2030, and to accelerate the vital shifts that are already underway to make sure that our economies underpin our survival and our success. And I want to thank our team of ministers and pay tribute to all our UK civil servants from across government, as well as world-leading scientists from a range of British institutions, including Kew Gardens and JNCC. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, we've been on this journey since the last CBD COP14 that I attended in Egypt in 2018, and in meetings with delegations from around the world, time and again, we heard praise for the way our world-class UK negotiators helped to broker this agreement. We know from experience here in the UK that when we set ambitious targets, what we see is an acceleration of action to meet them across government sectors and communities. And that is why we have worked so hard to secure these global targets. And just before I set off for Canada, I announced that we have taken the next steps towards leaving the environment in a better state than we found it. We're putting in a set of new stretching domestic targets into UK law under the Environment Act on air, water and waste, as well as nature, land and sea, to improve the state of the environment in our country. These targets will be challenging to meet, but they are achievable. And the global coalitions of ambition that we have been leading, co-leading and supporting will now shift towards supporting implementation of the new international nature agreement as well. Mr. Spe Mr Deputy Speaker, the UK is committed to playing our part now and in the months and years ahead. And while no country can solve this alone, if we work together to make this a decade of action, we stand not just to avoid the worst impacts, but by securing the abundance, diversity and connectivity of life on Earth to build a better future for every generation to come. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Sir Bell? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy yeah. Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of her statement. The agreement signed in Montreal this morning to protect 30 per cent of the planet for nature and restore 30 per cent of the planet's degraded ecosystems is welcome news. That we are to protect a minimum of 30 per cent of land and 30 per cent of our seas is a benchmark we must adhere to to avoid ecosystem collapse. I was glad to be part of the UK's delegation to COP15. The Secretary of State used her spot on the global stage to announce the UK's environmental targets, the ones were where she missed her own legally binding deadline in October. I note, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Secretary of State didn't announce the delayed targets to the House first in the proper way, and I think that speaks volumes. We are still to have an oral statement on those targets. It's quite astonishing, then, that after all of the warm world, the Government's own targets do not include a 30 per cent goal of protecting nature. The Secretary of State compared nature to Cinderella, Mr Deputy Speaker. That's the case, and the members for Camborne and Redruth, North East Hampshire and Suffolk Coastal must be the cruel stepsisters who have neglected her during their time in charge. The Government also failed to include overall measures for water quality and protected sites in their targets. The reality of the Secretary of State's watered down targets means our country and our communities will face even more toxic air and more sewage dumping for longer. A cynic's view might be the government is happy to commit to non-legally binding targets in Montreal while shirking any real responsibility at home. Ambitious environmental leadership means, at the very least, ensuring clean air, clean water and access to nature. But it doesn't matter how the government tries to dress it up, their targets do not go anywhere near far enough and it's our community that will suffer as a result. Rivers in England are used as open sewers. Not one is in a healthy condition. Only 14% meet good ecological standards. With no overall water quality targets, the Conservatives can continue to allow raw sewage to flow into our natural environment hundreds of thousands of times a year. How does that fit with our Montreal commitments? Yeah. Only Labour has a proper plan to clean up our waterways. We introduce mandatory monitoring with automatic fines, hold water bosses personally accountable for sewage pollution and give regulators the power to properly enforce the rules. One in five people in the UK with respiratory conditions such as asthma and COPD, which are worsened by breathing toxic air. We know this is especially dangerous for children and vulnerable adults, and I'm extremely concerned at the unambitious targets for air quality set out by the government. Labour are committed to tackling this health crisis once and for all with a Clean Air Act, including the right to breathe clean air, monitoring and tough new duties on ministers to make sure WHO clean air guidelines are kept. Of the 20 UN biodiversity targets agreed to in 2010, the UK has missed 17. 17, Mr Deputy Speaker. When it comes to the environment, the government constantly makes the wrong choices, delay vital action, duck the urgent challenges. Failure to deliver on environment targets at home show their promise at COP15 mean very little. The Secretary of State's own colleague at COP, the Lord Goldsmith, described the UK as one of the most nature depleted on the planet. The Environment Act must target on species abundance, which they were forced to concede by opposition amendments, promise only to halt the decline of species by 2030. How does that now sit with our Montreal commitments? Mr Deputy Speaker, it's clear from the Secretary of State's watered down environmental targets this Conservative government have given up on governing. 
Yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, I've never heard such rubbish from the opposition, but uh, I'm really quite sad about this. For a start, let's just get it clear. The Honourable Member, was, uh, it was good that he went to Montreal, but he was not a member of the UK Government's delegation, uh, but I'm glad that he went anyway, as did other members. And at the first opportunity, after getting clearance for the targets, I did inform Parliament and a written ministerial statement was laid in the Lords on Friday before uh, I made a short announcement into, uh, into, uh, into uh, where I was in Montreal. So in terms of... Um, it, I'm very clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, Genuinely, this agreement would not have been as strong if it had not been for the efforts of the UK government. Yeah. Even this morning, in the dark hours in Montreal, the text was reopened at our insistence to make sure that the depletion of nature was included in the text of what was agreed. At the same time, we have been working tirelessly day in, day out during this uh, negotiation to make sure that we did secure finances, because I'm very conscious of many nature-rich countries around the world need that financial support in order to make sure that uh, nature is restored. Now, in terms of what we're planning to do here in the UK, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, frankly, nature has been depleted ever since, frankly, the Industrial Revolution. That has recently been more recognised. That is why it is this government that put in place the Environment Act. By the way, that builds on a number of Environment Acts which previous Conservative administrations have put into place, recognising the importance of legislation, but also delivery in terms of that. The Honourable Gentleman refers to the air quality target. The only reason why we've kept what we consulted on of a 10 micrograms uh, per metre cube for PM2.5 by 2040 is because the Labour Mayor in London is failing to deliver it. And I'm absolutely yeah. confident in the yeah. rest of the country it can be delivered by 2030, yeah. but that's why we will continue to try and, and make sure that air quality is a priority for uh, mayors and for councils right around the country in that regard. Um, in terms of uh, moving forward, uh, the, uh, pretty much I think every SI has now been laid today. There is a slight delay on one of the SIs, but I expect those to be considered uh, by both Houses of Parliament next month. They will come into law, but meanwhile, we continue to work on our environmental improvement plan and making sure that the environment will be a better place than we inherited it. Matt Hancock. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, will the Secretary of State say a few words about the need not only to stop the diminution across the world of biodiversity, but ultimately to get to a place where the expansion of nature can once again happen? It is a long way off, but isn't it true that the UK Government leadership on this issue has just delivered a major landmark step forward? And we should all across this House be proud of the effort that the team's put in in order to make as much progress as this. In the international arena, it is hard to get big agreements, and the Secretary of State's just got one. Yeah. Yeah. I thank my honourable friend, and we both represent the magnificent county of Suffolk, and it's why we are trying to make sure that we continue that improvement of nature. That's why I believe he is a champion for dormice. I am champion for bittern. We've seen improvements in uh, both uh, the habitats for both animals. And it is critical that, frankly, a long-term situation like the environment it's important that the House actually comes together to recognise the importance of what has been achieved, uh, give credit, frankly, particularly to our civil servants in making that achievement, but also recognise the challenges ahead lie there for governments, for local councils, for industry, for, for, uh, uh, but also for individual choices that people make in what we are trying to do to not only protect the environment, but to enhance and restore and improve the environment in which we enjoy. David Linden. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Secretary of State for advance sight of our statement. Whether it's local schools like St Paul's Primary School in Shettleston with a focus on biodiversity in their school garden, or global summits like COP15, we all have our part to play, so we on these benches do welcome any progress made at COP15. Scotland's new biodiversity strategy includes the COP15 target of halting biodiversity loss by 2030, and it actually goes further with the target of restoring biodiversity by 2045. So, will the British government likewise produce a, a new biodiversity strategy, one which matches both the COP15 and Scottish targets? Likewise, ministers in Holyrood have recognised that the climate and biodiversity crises are inextric inextricably linked, and that one cannot be tackled whilst the other is ignored. It does the Secretary of State agree with this and agree that decisions to increase fossil fuel production and use will only ex um, accelerate biodiversity loss? 
Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Scottish Government led the UK in recognising the biodiversity crisis and has now led the UK in establishing a dedicated £65 million nature restoration fund. So, will the British Government follow this example and create a dedicated biodiversity restoration fund for England? And finally, um, with us, I'll close. Concerns have been raised about the sidelining of African states at the very end of the COP15 process and the overruling of their calls for dedicated funding to support biodiversity efforts. So, can the Secretary of State um, <coughs> outline does she share her deep concern at Global South nations being ignored, and does she agree that those who face the brunt of the climate and biodiversity crises must be heard in global climate negotiations? Well, I think the honourable gentleman and uh, indeed the Scottish Minister uh, Lorna Slater was out in Montreal as well, and it's really important that the UK works together to improve uh, the nature. And you know, I give credit to Scotland in that regard as well. Um, what I do want to say to him, though, is that we already have established funding in terms of the uh, uh, in, uh, nature of the climate fund. We are already, through the Blue Planet Fund as well, uh, undertaken a number of investments which will improve um, nature in this country, but also around the world, particularly thinking of Commonwealth countries, but overseas territories, uh, and as he refers to the South. Now, that's why the importance of the £30 billion uh, financing uh, funding that will go in uh, is, was particularly discussed back and forth, and the United Kingdom was very happy to make sure that got delivered, uh, recognising that we do need to make sure all around the world that we um, have a significant investment in that, and that the value is attributed to nature as much as it is to climate, if not even more. Because, candidly, we can do as much as we like on tackling climate change, but if we don't preserve and restore nature, then it will effectively be for naught. And that is why we have put so much work into doing this. It's why our Prime Minister uh, had set out in, in, uh, in Egypt when he went to COP27 about the importance of uh, restoring nature, of being critical uh, weight in terms of tackling climate change. And the Honourable Gentleman may be aware, of course, of our Environmental Land Management Scheme, where we started initially uh, the first phase of SFI and will be announcing more early in the new year as we make the transition from the traditional European funding, uh, which is effectively area based on how much land people owned, to being paying for certain goods in order to improve uh, the environment and reduce uh, carbon emissions. Douglas Ross. Much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is uh, an issue that rightly attracts a lot of attention, and particularly uh, school children in Murray often speak to me about biodiversity and nature. Uh, indeed, it is one of the reasons why a nature bill was included in the Scottish Conservative Manifesto for the Holyrood elections. Uh, the Secretary of State has outlined uh, the collaboration that there was with Scottish Government ministers out in Canada. Can she state what ongoing discussions there will be with the devolved administrations to ensure this crucial issue continues to be raised at the highest level within governments across the United Kingdom? Well, my honourable friend is right to point out about the collaboration, which is absolutely vital, um, recognising uh, the importance of uh, uh, nature corridors, but also the importance of biosecurity, uh, which unites our, our British Isles, uh, 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 Great Britain, uh, as well as the work we do through Northern Ireland as well. I think it's important to say that uh, we do have uh, regular meetings uh, with all the uh, governments of the, uh, the devolved administrations, and uh, we will continue to do that, in particular nature is uh, very critical, as I say, because of the transboundary nature that is evident, uh, self-evident by that. Uh, but it's, um, we will continue to try and make sure uh, that, uh, whether it's about species abundance, uh, whether it's about uh, thinking about how ways of reducing pollution, which has impacts on nature, we'll continue to work collaboratively uh, right across the United Kingdom. Barry Gardner. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I join the Secretary of State in paying tribute to the UK's officials for what they have achieved in the negotiations in Montreal, and indeed for David Cooper as the Deputy Executive Secretary, who's worked tirelessly there uh, for many, many years. Um, but she knows that despite 28 per cent of England already being designated as protected areas, just 4 per cent, scarcely 4 per cent, actually is being protected. The target of 30 per cent, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, to be protected by 2030 of our planet, however desirable, is just that. It is a target. It is nothing without a programme of implementation for the protective measures to restore those ecosystems and stop species extinctions. That programme needs interim deliverable goals 
Yet in the written ministerial statement last week, the earliest interim target against which the government's performance can be measured is 2037. Will she set out clear UK staging points against transparent baselines? And does she accept that the Poulsen report on financing of nature doesn't say 30 billion is required, but 711 billion? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I think to just correct the gentleman on the last uh, uh, thing he said. So what was published the other day was regarding the targets, which by the Environment Act have to be a minimum of 15 years. So the interim targets have not yet been published. They will be included in the Environmental Improvement Plan, and they, will, uh, they are a minimum of five years, and that is what we will be setting out in the Environmental Improvement Plan. So just to get uh, the record straight, they are two different uh, uh, targets. In terms of uh, making improvements, I completely understand what the Honourable Gentleman is saying. There are a number of uh, situations where uh, we want S triple SIs to be in better status than they are. That is why we will work through the Environmental Improvement Plan. It is why we are actually taking advantage of Brexit freedoms um, to make sure we can redesign how the money that currently supports farmers and landowners uh, in terms of uh, the CAP will be repurposed to make sure that they are achieving public goods through environmental improvement but also tackling carbon emissions. Will this landmark agreement open the way for larger scale uptake of solutions such as mangrove and seagrass as a means to capture carbon and help tackle global heating? Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Right Honourable Lady may not know, I am absolutely mad for mangroves. Uh, they are amazing. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot grow them in this country due to uh, the fact that we are not in the tropics. However, we do have salt marsh, and uh, we, we continued and will want to be seeing increasing elements of that. Uh, in terms of quite a lot of the funding of our Blue Planet Fund, I expect to see a substantial amount of that to be purposed uh, towards mangroves. We have already got projects underway, I believe, in Madagascar and Indonesia, and we will continue to try and develop those. I have also recently returned from the International Biodiversity Summit, COP15, where I met representatives from the One Piece Nation, uh, indigenous people from Peru. Their fear was palpable. Their neighbours are dying whilst the world has cast them aside. So can the Secretary of State tell me what the UK Government is doing to prevent their extinction? And was COP15 a missed opportunity to protect the rights of Indigenous people? Robert, I appreciate the agreements only closed uh, earlier today, but uh, this was a significant win for the Indigenous people and local communities. Uh, that's why it played such a prominent part in the negotiations. Uh, and I say, I think she's probably behind the time, but I think it's important that we continue to make sure that. Well, the Honourable Lady uh, obviously wants an adjournment debate. I'm sure she might get one. Uh, but uh, that will just give us a further opportunity to say what a magnificent achievement this was for the world. And frankly, it's thanks to the UK Government making sure that delivered not only for people in the UK, but people in Indigenous communities, lo uh, Indigenous uh, peoples, local communities. And indeed, we will continue to strive to make the, the nature for the planet a lot better than it has been that we inherited from the last Government. Andrew James. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend for this statement and for all her work and leadership on this issue? Protecting ecosystems and halting biodiversity loss is critical to safeguard our planet for future generations. Does she agree that maintaining international leadership and placing this issue central to government policy is the only way to ensure that the changes delivered will be the, uh, changes needed will be the changes delivered? Yeah. I agree entirely with my honourable friend, and that's why it was important when the Prime Minister went to Sharm el Sheikh for COP27, building on the uh, COP26 presidency he had, where we included nature as a full day of the climate uh, change conference. He was very specific uh, to refer to the £3 billion of financing as part of the £11 billion total on climate financing will be dedicated to nature. And he recognises how critical it is, and that's why we will continue to endeavour to make sure that we improve uh, the nature, natural environment in this country, but also around the world. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The agreement of a framework which commits to halt and reverse biodiversity loss is, of course, very welcome. But it is a bit staggering that the government's own environment targets, smuggled out late last week, will actually fail to deliver 
on that goal. They don't even include goals to improve the condition of protected nature sites or overall water quality. So, as a priority, will she align the Environment Act with the new commitments made in Montreal, and specifically with just 38% of SSSIs and 14% of rivers in good condition? Will she now commit to consulting and setting those crucial targets next year? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Lady is right to congratulate uh, the world for recognising that and also the UK's role in making sure uh, that uh, nature and restoration be included in that text. Uh, and even if she didn't include it, I can assure her that was the reason why it got put back into the text <coughs> early this morning. Um, but I want to flag to her that in terms of the indicators uh, that we consulted on, they've set out very clearly the apex indicator is about species abundance. So there's a number of other targets which will aim towards that. By achieving that, I'm confident that we will achieve some of the other activities uh, to which she refers, and that will include, of course, the increasing the number of, uh, uh, number of hectares of habitats uh, for nature in this country. Speaker. Uh, protecting nature and increasing biodiversity is so often led by grassroots organisations. Uh, so can I invite the Secretary of State to commend the work of the Friends of Miss Wally's Field, led by Paul Wiggins in my constituency, who takes a piece of land between the Freehold and Ridge Estate areas in Lancaster and does tree planting and wildflower planting and involves children from local schools at Castle View, Christchurch and Central Lancaster High School. Um, will she uh, commend the work of those volunteers but also reaffirm her government's commitment that they will not return to fracking? Well, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do certainly commend the children and the volunteers to whom she refers. Uh, fracking has got nothing to do with what I'm uh, talking about today, and that statement's already been made separately uh, by energy ministers previously. John Mora. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Addressing biodiversity loss is an essential part of addressing climate change. But as with climate change, we see no urge, sense of urgency or leadership in action from this government. Does the Secretary of State accept that her department's failure to set targets <coughs> for water quality or habit, ha habitat protections in England undermine talks at COP15? She calls, Cinderella, she calls nature the Cinderella mm. of the story. but. Cinderella was never forced to swim in sewage by the Ugly Sisters. <laughs> that achievement belongs to this government. I can say our beaches are cleaner than we inherited them in 2010 from a Labour government. That's clear. She must be very proud of her uh, previous Labour government record achievement on that. But what I will say to the Honourable Lady is it matters. It doesn't matter about the countryside, the coast. It matters in our urban environments as well. Uh, we already have existing targets when it comes to water quality. In fact, I was discussing that with my honourable friend, uh, the Environment Minister, Environmental Quality Minister, today about approaches that we're going to take to try and improve, in particular, water quality, thinking about chemicals within our water. That is particularly problematic in urban areas. And that is uh, something that we need to work with local councils as well as the Environment Agency uh, in order to try and get changes there so that we do clean up uh, the water right around the country. And I'm sure that she'll join us when we need to take appropriate action in her constituency in the future. Here Hobhouse. Deputy Speaker, a historic deal has been reached today, including a global target to conserve at least 30% of land and inland water, at a time when we know that not a single river in the UK is free from pollution. The government only last week scrapped the indicator on river health, the only measure for water companies and the public to know whether their water is clean. Without this indicator, how will my constituents in Bath and the Fridicia know that their water is clean? Mm. So I think the, um, the Honourable Lady uh, is incorrect in her understanding about that. So the targets are still in place about our uh, aim to achieve a 75% good uh, ecological status of rivers by 2027. That's, the, that's what we signed up to when we were part of the European Union. That's still our target today, and that's what we'll keep working on. It's important that we try and continue to try and improve the environment. She'll know that, of the difficult things that happen with air quality in her city, and uh, we will continue to try and make sure that we uh, take that right across the country. Hilary Ben. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. I join the Secretary of State and others in the House in welcoming this very important agreement. Can she tell us when she intends to bring forward any proposals that may be required to ensure that here in the UK, because the agreement only means anything if countries do what they've signed up to, 
match the very ambitious targets that have just been agreed in Montreal? Well, through the Environment Act, some uh, was, uh, act targets in terms of improving the environment were already in uh, primary legislation. We have just announced um, the, or confirmed pretty much the environmental targets that we consulted on early in the year. Uh, the statutory instruments are being laid, I believe, today. I think one is being laid tomorrow uh, so that Parliament can vote on those legally binding targets. Meanwhile, we continue to make other improvements uh, in terms of uh, activities, whether that's about clean air strategy, whether that's about the biosecurity plan, whether that's about already existing plans and the biodiversity increasing, whether it's about the landscape recoveries. We are already doing a lot of work and indeed we're changing our funding uh, for, um, for away from the uh, basic payment system and uh, from what the European Union did in terms of uh, amounts of payments to improve the environment uh, being based on the amount of land somebody owned uh, to actually now paying for services so that we can do more spatial targeting in a more intelligent way of how we can actually improve water quality, of how we can reduce pollution. So we'll be taking that forward in aspects of the environmental improvement plan to be published next month, but also in terms of the changes that we'll be making uh, through the environmental land management scheme as well. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all welcome the Secretary of State's uh, statement? I think it's really, really encouraging news, and I think we're all excited by what you said. As someone who has been involved in prior by, uh, biodiversity drives and planted some three and a half thousand trees on my own land. I know that other landowners will get involved if the incentive is there. So I'm inspired by the aims, but will the Secretary of State outline how the Right Honourable Lady believes the UK as a whole can achieve these aims and how the devolved nations will play into these plans and that we can all win uh, in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. I know that the people in Northern Ireland are also keen to see enhanced uh, nature. And uh, I recall my trip earlier this year where I went to the Giants Causeway for the first time ever and saw beauty in nature, but also the force of nature, and a desire to continue to try and improve that. Uh, in terms of how we work together going forward, uh, it will be up to individual devolved administrations. But I know that the Northern Irish ministers and the executive have been very supportive of our approaches so far. Final question on the statement. Patrick Grady. Deputy Speaker, what impact is the UK's decision to cut the aid budget from 0.7% to 0.5% of GNI having on the UK's ability to contribute to the 10-point plan for financing biodiversity? We have actually increased the amount of uh, uh, ODA going into uh, environmental and climate change uh, projects. And uh, I'm excited about that, but we will continue to see more money coming in uh, from around the world, including private sector and philanthropic donors, in order to help achieve uh, these ambitious aims. And I'm excited about the future decade. I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for her statement today and responding to questions for over half an hour. And now we move on to the final statement today on alcohol uprating. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Um, with, mis with permission, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to make a statement about the alcohol tax system. <clears throat> when last year at Autumn Budget 2021, the then Chancellor, now Prime Minister, announced the biggest reforms to alcohol duty in 140 years, he did so in order to change an outdated, impractical system. Following our country's departure from the EU, our changes will overhaul the UK's obsolete rules, which our membership of the Union precluded us from doing. With these new freedoms, we will embark on radically simplifying the entire system and slashing red tape. The new alcohol tax system will adopt a common sense approach where the higher a drink's strength, the higher the duty, whilst new release will be made available to help pubs and small producers to thrive. In doing so, we have made a system that fits with our national priorities, encourages growth and innovation, aligns with public health goals and is fairer for hard-working producers. The aim that lies at the root of this reform is to make the system fairer, simpler to use and more supportive of business. Notwithstanding these ambitions, we fully understand that businesses face difficulty and uncertainty in the face of rising energy bills and inflation. I have listened to and value stakeholders from across the sector. And I understand that they want certainty and need reassurance in these challenging times. That is why today, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, conf I can confirm that the freeze to UK alcohol duty rates has been extended six months to the 1st of August 2023. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> 
Whilst new duty rates typically come in each year on the 1st of February, I can confirm that the Chancellor will instead make his decision on future, future duty rates at Spring Budget 2023 to give businesses certainty and time to prepare. And to further support the industry, we are going further by confirming that if changes to duty are announced then, they will not take effect until 1 August 2023. This is to align with the date the historic forms of alcohol duty system come into force and amounts to an effective six-month extension to the current duty freeze. Most importantly, to minimise the burden on business, it avoids the sector having to deal with multiple changes to duty rather than one. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I mentioned a moment ago, the alcohol duty reforms will help create a simpler, fairer and healthier duty system. A higher rate for sparkling wines will come to an end, meaning they will pay the same rate as still wine. Liqueurs will be put on the same footing as fortified wine, meaning a sherry will now pay the same duty as a spirit liqueur, and the duty rate on super-strength white cider will increase in order to address public health concerns. New draft relief will be worth £100 million a year, and to ensure smaller craft producers can benefit, the threshold for qualifying containers will be 20 litres. <laughs> the wine industry will also be supported as they adapt to the new system. Duty on all wine between 11.5% and 14.5% alcohol by volume, known as ABV, will have its duty calculated as if it were 12.5% ABV. This will last for 18 months from the implementation of the new system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, pubs, cider makers, brewers, distilleries, and winemakers have a historic place at the heart of our communities. They provide not only thousands of jobs, but hubs that enrich and often define the social fabric of our villages, towns, and cities. By saying to the industry that they will face just one single industry wide change next summer rather than two or more over the course of the year, we are giving maximum certainty to industry. Hospitality is a major part of the economy, and while these remain challenging times, we are doing everything we can to support individual hospitality businesses of every size so that they can have a prosperous new year. I commend this statement to the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. The Government has confirmed it will be freezing alcohol duty rates for six months. I know that this sector will welcome this announcement, especially given the difficulty the businesses are facing at the moment, whether they are producers, suppliers or hospitality venues. But I must say it is absolutely laughable that the Government has announced this change in the name of certainty. We should call it what it is. It is a U-turn. The previous Chancellor announced a freeze, the current Chancellor scrapped it and now it's back on. How did we get here? In October 2020, the government announced a call for evidence seeking views on how the alcohol duty system could be reformed. At the time, it said it will make the system simpler, more economically rational and less administratively burdensome on businesses and HMRC. But what we have seen then, since then is indecision, U-turns and delays. The Government has finally published a response to the alcohol duty consultation in September this year. Then in the shambolic mini-budget that crushed the British economy, the then Chancellor announced a freeze in alcohol duty due to come in force in February 2023. However, the new Chancellor scrapped this plan freeze in autumn statement in October, just a couple of months ago. And we are now have, what we now have is a screeching U-turn. The freeze is back on play, in place. So we see it again. The government has no long-term plan for the British economy. They cannot provide the certainty businesses and their hard-working employees need to plan for the tough winter ahead. They have left businesses and consumers out in the cold. They may not want to hear this, but this is the reality. We're uh, they're unsure what regulatory systems will be in place in as little as two months. Two months. Mr Speaker, today Labour has found that more than 70,000 venues have had to reduce their opening hours due to the price of energy bills. 70,000 venues. That is almost a third of pubs bars and hotels missing out on customers at the busiest, most profitable time of the year. 
These businesses and producers of wine, beer, cider and spirits enrich our communities and boost our high streets. I recently popped into the Standard, a pub in my constituency of Erith and Thamesmead, who are really struggling with soaring energy bills and the lack of government support. They need a government on their side. The government promised to tell the House what the new energy support scheme will look like before Christmas, but we've yet to hear anything from them. Only Labour has set out a long-term plan to get our economy growing again. Look into the future. Labour agrees with the principles behind the alcohol duty review. We want to see the alcohol duty system made simpler and more consistent, and we recognise that there is a balance to be struck between supporting businesses and consumers, protecting public health, and maintaining the source of revenue for the Shaka. But this statement leaves many questions unanswered. Not least can the Minister give an indication of his plans for the duty reforms in the coming spring. Secondly, can the Minister confirm whether the alcohol duty reform package will be implemented in full? And if so, can the Minister outline what imp impact assessment has been carried out on the impact of the transition to the new duty regime? I hope the Minister can provide some clarity today. The alcohol sector and businesses and jobs it supports have suffered with enough uncertainty, with enough U-turns. These are major changes that will affect businesses and consumers in all our constituencies, and I hope they will be properly thought through so we do not see a future last-minute policy announcement and changes like we have seen today. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister. Well, I am grateful to the Honourable Lady. Just to be clear, this is good news, yeah, Mr. Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good news for every single sector in our alcohol industry. It's good news for those who drink in our pubs. And, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the crucial thing is it gives certainty to the industry. The hospitality industry employs 2.1 million people, I think, at the latest reckoning. It's a huge part of our economy. So, yes, we do want to do what we can to support them. Turning to her. Uh, questions. I mean, she, she, she talks about a U-turn. Just to be clear, we said we would introduce a radical reform of alcohol duty. We are going to introduce that reform. It will come in place next August. It's a reform that couldn't have happened if we hadn't left the European Union. It will introduce, for the very first time, differential duty rates uh, on tap and in the supermarkets. I think the public want to see that because they value their pubs, Mr Deputy Speaker. They understand the importance of pubs to their communities. Um, and, and, I say, and I say to the Honourable Lady, um, who intervenes uh, having sat down, um, she talked about her local pub. Obviously, we want to assist her local pub and all pubs up and down the country. That's why we've put in place an energy bill relief scheme worth £18.1 billion. That is a huge intervention. Uh, what I can tell her is, um, of course, uh, it's, it's a very generous scheme, but it is expensive, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and we need to ensure longer term affordability and value for money for the taxpayer. That's why we are currently carrying out the review with the aim of reducing the public finances' exposure to volatile international energy prices from April 2023. We will announce the outcome of this review in the new year to ensure businesses have sufficient certainty about future support before the current scheme ends in March 2023. But of course, we should also remember that that support with energy comes on the back of the enormous support we put in place during the pandemic. Grants, bounce back loans, and of course, furlough for all of those staff working in the hospitality sector. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is an ambitious reform package that we are proceeding with next year. We felt that the appropriate thing to do is to give certainty to the sector as soon as possible, knowing that they would face only one up rating. It's the right thing to do, and it shows that this government is supporting the hospitality industry. Sir Peter Bottomley. Can I say to the Minister that, uh, as we discovered, like the Honourable Member of the Opposition, I support what's yeah, been announced yeah, today. Yeah. I declare an interest that I drink most things except super strength draft cider. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say to the Minister, in particular on the wine side, that having the average rate at 12.5% uh, degree, degrees is right, and that to try to have stepped rates won't work, because people don't know what strength the wine is going to be. It fluctuates yeah. naturally. And I think that having a, a revenue-neutral level makes sense, and I hope that will continue beyond the, the, the 12, uh, 18 months. I hope that the Minister will consider whether farm gate concessions can be made for the growing number of uh, vineyards in this country, and I hope that between now and the budget, that the Chancellor will calculate what the price and tax elasticity is.
because often when duty rates are frozen, the revenue actually goes up. There are times when the rate has gone up and the revenue has gone down. That's perverse. Well, to the father of the house, I don't think I'll ever get a question again which mentions both elasticity and high strength cider. Um, uh, an interesting combination of points. Um, in, it, is a very, it is a very good point about uh, wine. I've, I've enjoyed engaging with all the main uh, alcohol sectors uh, in the run-up to coming to this decision, mainly in November. Um, uh, and the point has been made, uh, as he knows, we are requiring all wine between 11.5% and 14.5% ABV to be calculated at a duty rate as if it were 12.5% ABV for 18 months. Uh, there is that transition in place. What I would say is, were that to be made permanent, we would have to ask ourselves, would that not undermine a regime which is ultimately based around a, an underlying logic of taxation by strength? So I do understand the point uh, my honourable friend makes, and I, I will continue to engage with the sector on. Stuart Housie. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, can I welcome the statement? I have long supported an alcohol content <coughs> duty regime, so I hope this does deliver the fairness the sector needs. Uh, can I just say, as a gentle aside, we did not need Brexit to do this. The UK could have applied for a derogation. They chose not to do that over decades. However, today I have some technical questions. The previous Chancellor announced a one-year freeze on alcohol duty in the Growth Plan 2022, which was due to cost £545 million in 2023-24. The current Chancellor then scrapped that with an anticipated additional yield of £1.3 billion in 2023-24. That was in the Autumn Statement 2022. So can I ask, first of all, how can a one-year freeze costing £500 million next year suddenly generate £1.3 billion of additional yield when it is cancelled in the same year? Also, we have been told that the freeze is to be reintroduced until August. How much will that cost? the Exchequer. Now, on the proposal specifically following the post-21 budget consultation, they have been reported as having a modest cost of only £25 million next year. That was in the Autumn Statement Green Book. But the statement seems to suggest the cost of the Exchequer of the draft beer relief scheme alone will be £100 million a year. So can I ask the Minister to explain to the House what will the net cost of this be, either to the Exchequer or to the industry, because as it stands right now, the numbers aren't clear and in some cases don't add up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman. I'm glad that he supports the principle of the reform package coming in place next August. I hope members across the House. Uh, can do so. Um, he, uh, in terms of the cost, obviously that depends on what decision is made uh, in the budget next year. That is a matter for the Chancellor at the time. I think we now know that that will be on the 15th of March, so not too long to wait. Um, but I would just pick up one specific point he made. Um, the Honourable Gentleman made the point that it was not necessary to leave the European Union to make these changes. Just to be clear, EU law does not allow Member States to differentiate beverages on qualitative characteristics such as whether the product is on draft. EU law actively discourages any attempt to support the on-trade through the duty system. It is also true about having a system based on ABV. But by and large, that would have been very difficult as well. The fact is, this is a radical reform, and it has been made possible by Brexit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, uh, and I declare an interest as the chairman of the All Party uh, Parliamentary Group on uh, on beer and pub, and someone who enjoys much of uh, what yeah, we've uh, yeah, much yeah, of what we've yeah. discussed. Can I at least, Mr. Deputy Speaker, warmly welcome uh, my honourable friend's uh, statement? This will provide significant certainty to an industry that has experienced significant challenges over recent times, through the impact of the weather on, their cr on crops to the uh, uh, impact on uh, energy prices, on, back of the fall on the back of the fallout from, uh, from COVID. So this is a much-needed platform from which the industry can really build uh, a strong uh, future. I would also say to the Minister, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the industry is looking forward with enthusiasm to the differential uh, uh, beer, uh, draft beer duty. This is an important principle. And can I ask uh, my honourable friend, will he consider going further, come the budget in, uh, uh, in March, 
much further than the 5% that has already been promised, because the principal and the Brexit dividend can really pay significant benefits to our pubs and beer industry right across the country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm extremely grateful to my right honourable friend, and um, I think uh, it, it's important to stress that he's become the chairman of the All Party Beer Group, but we should remember, of course, the work of my honourable friend, the member for Dudley yeah. South. Yeah. Who, who was the former chairman? He can't speak as, as he is a whip, um, yeah, yeah. but he also put in place um, uh, uh, all of those sessions, uh, lobbying MPs, lobbying ministers, and, and making the case sessions. for beer. Um, which, of course, you know, much as we enjoy that, is a, is a major employer in this country, and it is a major. And my, my round friend makes a really important point about this about differential duty. I mean, just to put it in context, the, the duty cut on cider by, 15, by 5% will be the biggest cut to cider duty since 1923. So it is significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I, I can't speak from the dispatch box, make the decisions for the budget next, uh, next year, but it's not too far away, and I'm sure there will be plenty of chances for colleagues to engage up to them. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Stockport, my constituency, has several wonderful producers, including Robinson's Breweries and, and Stockport Gin. They've been through a lot over the last few years. So I want to ask the Minister, when will this government finally end the U-turns and delays and agree a long-term solution, long-term support package for the alcohol sector? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for raising the cases in this constituency. I think it was Robinson's Brewery and Stockport Gin. Very grateful for them for all they are doing um, uh, in, in these challenging times to provide employment in his constituency and support consumers with the products that they offer. Um, this, that's what this is all about. It's, in, it's about supporting those companies in our constituencies, these vital sectors. And, and he asks about a, a long-term commitment. This is the biggest reform to alcohol duty for 140 years. It is a very significant reform, getting the balance between competitive rates of duty and, and, consider, and the consideration of public health, which is incredibly important. I think it's, it's, it's an opportunity we should all be seizing and welcome. Dan. Um, can I warmly welcome these yeah, proposals yeah, announced yeah, yeah. by the Minister today in one of his most impressive performances at the dispatch yeah, box? Yeah, yeah, in yeah. particular, the differential duty rates to allow pubs and restaurants to charge uh, a lower rate, to be charged from their customers a lower rate of duty than the off trade, something many of us have called for for a long time. And could I also congratulate him on the point which was made earlier by the Father of the House that the differential rates on wines will be consolidated to a single rate for the vast majority of wines, because that uh, reaches the principle of simplicity, which was an essential part of the consultation. Could I ask him, the 18-month period is dependent on what? Because if, he, if we were to move then to differential bans per percentage of ABV, that doesn't really help the trade to prepare. They need to know where they're going. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for his, for his kind words. Um, my first ever PPS job was as a PPS for my right honourable friend, as, as a brilliant health minister. Um, it, he mentioned simplicity. He's absolutely right. That's a key part of the reform package. Um, in terms of the wine easement, as we call it, the 18 months is there precisely to enable the sector to adapt to the changes that are coming. And he also mentions the on and off trade differences, and he's absolutely right to emphasise there's a key point on those differences. It is, again, about public health. The evidence shows that whilst all drinking should be done responsibly, where people are socialising, going to the pub, the evidence is this is light, less likely to encounter the sort of more severe end of uh, problem drinking that is more likely to happen in private. Hence, one of the reasons we have the differential, Mr Deputy yeah, yeah. Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Now, the Scotch Whisky Association said on behalf of producers that they were furious at the government's decision to increase uh, rates uh, of duty um, in the autumn statement. And so, absolutely, this freeze is welcome. But distilling is an energy intensive business. The Minister has stood at the dispatch box and said that the energy bills um, report will come in the new year. The Chancellor assured me at the dispatch box of the autumn statement that it would come before Christmas. I'd be grateful if you could explain the delay. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady, and she does make an important point. We are aware of the importance of energy costs. Um, I, did, I was absolutely clear just now we will report in the new year. It has taken slightly longer than expected. Um, these are complex matters. Uh, you know, it's, it's complex enough putting in place household support. Non-domestic support is particularly complicated because of the huge range of businesses involved. But let's be clear what is happening, Mr Deputy Speaker. Six months of support since October worth £18.1 billion pounds 
for businesses, including pubs, including distillers, including breweries, with their energy bills. It is huge, but of course I know people want to know what happens next, and we will be coming forward in the new year with the results of our review. Ms. Ross. Much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it's encouraging to hear from across the House the support for these duty reforms, which were originally announced as a manifesto commitment at Rosile Distillery uh, in my Murray constituency. Oh, uh, and Murray is, of good. course, home to more Scotch whisky distilleries than any other constituency ones, in too. this House. Uh, and as uh, the member from Milton Keynes says, uh, many uh, very good ones. Uh, I have been um, pressing both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to maintain the freeze uh, for as long as possible uh, on duty. For Scotch whisky. It is important for the entire industry eh, and the jobs that rely on it. Will the Exchequer Secretary take on board what the Father of the House has also said, that when it comes to the budget in March, that they will listen to the industry, who have proven Treasury officials wrong time after time, who have predicted that an increase in duty would increase revenue to the Treasury, in fact, a freeze in duty also increases revenue to the Treasury, and it would be very welcome to see that continuing going forward. Well, I am extremely grateful to my honourable friend. He obviously speaks with great knowledge on these matters. He has been a consistent champion of the Scots whisky industry, standing up in this place, whether it's tariffs or, of course, duties. Um, I know that he was lobbying the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to continue the freeze, so I hope he's pleased with the result. Uh, in terms of what happens going forward, of course, I will be engaging with the Scots whisky industry and, indeed, um, all the other alcohol sectors. But I think the clear point is this extension of the freeze is good news for every single sector, and I hope that colleagues welcome it. Yeah. Morris. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure if I should declare an interest but I do enjoy an occasional tipple of glass of beer. Can I thank the Minister for his statement? And can, I, can I just seek some clarification in, in relation to his comments on differential rates of duty? It, the Minister mentioned the need for certainty uh, and also the need to encourage diversity in choice in the small brewery sector. And, and in the statement, he referred to the new draft relief worth 100 million a year to ensure smaller craft brewers can benefit and he mentioned that the threshold for qualifying containers will be 20 litres. Can he go a little further and say something about the taper in duty? Is the government going to address the cliff edge above 5,000 hectolitres for small producers? Um, the Honourable Gentleman also very good, makes a very good point. Um, just to clarify, the draft relief is the new differential duty between the rate applied to uh, alcohol purchased on draft, so in, i.e. in the pub, as opposed to, for example, in a supermarket. This is about creating um, the level playing field. In terms of small brewers' relief, this is now becoming small producers' relief, so it extends, for example, to cider makers. Um, I, I would say to, to the House a general point. There is um, a, a chart I have here. I won't be getting it out. Please, no, Mr. Deputy Speaker, showing the old rates and the new rates that will come in under reform, and it is striking how much leaner uh, the, the new system is, but I'm more than happy to write him with details of the taper and the technical points, and I think he will observe that this is a much simpler system. Andrew Jones. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I welcome this extension to the duty freeze, and I was particularly pleased to see the, uh, the draft relief to support the important on-trade. Um, will my honourable friend be able to comment or write to me about the proposals for mergers and acquisitions to absorb production over three years rather than one? Uh, uh, basically allowing that to happen would facilitate uh, a smoother business transition, smoother ownership of the sector. Would you be able to comment or perhaps write to me? If I may say, first of all, to my honourable friend, of course he was an Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, um, and I should put on record that he, he did a lot of the work, Mr Deputy Speaker, that led to us being able to deliver these reforms in the first place. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the question you asked about mergers and acquisitions, absolutely more than happy to meet with him and also to share with him further detail from officials about this question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I speak as the Chairman for VAPPG on Alcohol Harm. And can I first of all thank the Minister for meeting with me and Alcohol Harm Charities recently. Uh, whilst I welcome the introduction of uh, duty in regards to the strength of drinks, in my view it still does not quite go far enough, although I do appreciate the differential duty. Uh, what assurances can he give to, to me, all those concerned about alcohol harm and alcohol harm charities, that he will continue to work cross-party and cross-department to make sure that public health is fundamental in any alcohol duty changes moving forward? 
Well, I am very grateful, Honourable Gentleman. I did enjoy meeting with uh, himself, other parliamentarians, and indeed um, alcohol harm stakeholders. I think that was November the 24th in the Treasury. Um, it was a good meeting, and I think that there was an acceptance there that what we are trying to do with this reform package is strike that balance. Um, we do want to have competitive duty rates. We do want to look at things like the, le the, the playing field that exists, levelling playing field between pubs and the supermarkets. But equally, absolutely, alcohol harm has to be at the heart of this, the consideration of public health. That is why the reform package in August has one underlying principle, taxation on the basis of AB ABV. We think that is the right way forward, balancing both those approaches. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I very much welcome the, uh, the statement that's good news, uh, not, not simply because the hospitality industry are on their knees, but also because the steep increases in prices has led to more people not having a social drink with friends, but instead a sustained drinking at home mentality, which can be detrimental to families. I ask the question to the Minister this Has the Minister considered taxation aimed at multi buys in supermarkets? In coordination with the welcome freeze for pubs and hospitality. Thank you. Well, I'm very grateful to the honourable gentleman. Um, as I said last time, he asked me a question. Um, the speaker's chair always seems to, 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 to save the best to last, and um, he hits the nail on the head. Now, let's be clear: he's talking about friends who can't go for a drink uh, because of the economic pressures, the enormous surge in energy costs, the rise in inflation. The biggest impact economically is on consumption and therefore discretionary spend, such as in pubs, uh, hitting hospitality. So when we talk about the support that matters, it isn't just help for businesses with their energy bills, it's the help we're giving to consumers so that they can still find that expenditure to support our pubs this winter. And of course, we're helping them by freezing duty for six more months. It's a win-win for consumers and for the sector, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his statement today and for responding to questions for just under half an hour. So thank you very much. We now come to the motion on Deputy Speakers. Minister to move. The question is as on the motion on Deputy Speakers. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Or the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day.